Welcome to Out of the Blank. Welcome to another episode of Out of the Blank Podcast. I'm here with Gary and Larry, two people excited to talk about a subject that Larry uh, sparked up curiosity in. And I'm going to say it's the Cuba Project, but I also know it ties in with the Bay of Pigs invasion. Um, Gary, uh, Larry, please, I'll let you take the reins since you seem to be the leader here. Sure. And I think Gary asked some interesting questions about the Cuba Project and the Bay of Pigs when we were together last time on the panel. So, you know, we can try to feed some of that in. I think one of the reasons this subject is so important to me is that for those people who are interested in President Kennedy, JFK, the events of of administration, um, the Bay of Pigs kind of stands out. Like it was one of the first things that happened after he was elected president. This is before the Cuban Missile Crisis, this is, and it, and it was a disaster. I mean, it's like t- taking a brand new president, putting him into the White House, he's there for a month, and suddenly, you know, a disaster of such magnitude happens that it could totally run anyone's administration. You know, it, there, you, you could not find a harder, more challenging way to, to enter, you know, American government as taking office as a popularly elected president and then having the United States of America defeated militarily by Cuba. I mean, like, what are, what are you going to do? Uh, so, well, he inherited a house. <laughs> he inherited what I would call a house with a uh, pipe problem or a burst in the main line. Um, These are all inherited issues before Kennedy took office, which makes you really question a lot of the aspects that Kennedy gets blamed for in the long run. Bay of Pigs invasion, depending on, um, I guess, the right wing narrative would be that uh, Kennedy really messed up at the Bay of Pigs because he didn't send reinforcements to help people that were on the beach um, in Cuba. And a bunch, a lot of people uh, lost their lives. But it was a situation that Kennedy said he wasn't going to do airstrikes into. Um, unless they, if I'm not mistaken, unless they needed him or unless they, uh, it called for it. Actually, Kennedy spelled out a very simple game plan. And we actually have that because we have the presidential directive for the project. So we know what he legally authorized the CIA to do. And all he really authorized the CIA to do was to land uh, a group of Cuban trainees, uh, p- people that have been trained in, in Guatemala, essentially land those people into Cuba, uh, put the boats in af- you know, after dark, make sure the boats are out of Cuban waters by daylight, and the Cuban brigade is, is there to fight its own battle. I mean, basically, he was, he was made a lot of promises about what was in place as far as support from you know, guerrilla operations on the... But, he made a very minimal directive and and basically let's like keep the United States out of, which is exactly what President Eisenhower had said when he started the whole thing a year earlier. Uh, But the the story gets more complex than that. I I think Rob, your, your point about inheriting a, a house that, you know, he did not, he did not have an inspection report on before he bought the place. You know, they would have, it, one of the things JFK himself said is when when he was taken in by Eisenhower to do kind of like the the pres- president elect meeting, you know, where the outgoing president brings you in and says, you know, here here are all the problems I'm wrestling with, and you know, here's what you're really going to have to solve. You know, it's, oh, oh, well, great, I didn't really realize that. And he said Eisenhower did not talk about Cuba. He, he didn't. He talked about Laos. He talked about Southeast Asia. Uh, it was Cuba was not really one of 
you know, when he's going down the list of national concerns, it wasn't anything that he spent any time at all on. So when Kennedy actually takes office and starts getting National Security Council briefings, he literally was, was shocked by the position that he was in and the fact that all this effort was culminating about literally in a, a, a D-Day type invasion of Cuba. He knew that there had been a Cuba project. He, he, he was briefed that there was something going on uh, about Cuba. He was briefed on the fact that uh, Cubans were being trained to infiltrate and go on the island and, and conduct guerrilla operations against Castro. And, and essentially that the US was working to overthrow the Castro regime. He was not briefed, nor did Eisenhower mention that we were just about to actually launch an amphibious assault on Cuba. So the, the very first, the very first question that he asked, he said, "Well, okay, you know, I'm, I'm just coming on board. Show me the plan." I, I read. I know how to read. I know read. Yeah, give me the plan for this. And the CIA said, "Well, we don't have a plan in writing. It's too secret." It's like, oh, okay. <laughs> so there's no plan. <laughs> I think uh, I think it was actually more than Eisenhower. I think that was Nixon. It was Nixon's plan. He was on the 5412 committee and he was behind the scenes. Well, I'm sure Eisenhower was aware of it, but it was Nixon's baby with the Bay of Pigs because they assumed he was going to become president in 1960. Shock, Kennedy's in. Now what do we do? Okay, we we gonna tell them the truth. Are we gonna what are we gonna do? So Dulles knew I I they knew that it couldn't work without air support or troops from the U.S. And they thought, although Kennedy told them no, I won't uh, I won't send in American troops. They thought once the guys are on the beach and stuck, he will have to. He will he won't back down. You know, it it would be suicide. You know, as a president, ruin his his whole image and his first year in office and they lied to him i mean they told him uh well you know if we if we land these guys on the beach and we establish a beachhead then they can ask america for support and you can send them the support and then the guys in the mountains that are fighting again like castro was will join them and it was all a lie and and nick dulles left town he wasn't even there when it happened and so they knew that it couldn't work without support and they were putting the screws to Kennedy was what they were doing. Well, and then that, afterwards they blame them when it fails. <laughs> yeah, Gary, I think that's the that's the general print, and and a lot of that is absolutely true. But I think one of the things we you've got to understand is at the point that you're making is that the whole Cuba project was supposed to succeed. It was never supposed to come to the Bay of Pigs. It was supposed to succeed before the November elections which kind of leads back to the starting point of what did Eisenhower actually authorize? You know, what, what was put together? Because obviously nothing happened before the election. Yeah, the, whatever, whatever Nixon thought, and, and I will say, here's a fascinating thing, because I have actually gone through all of the special committee meetings, uh, special operations committee, the, the group that you're talking about, Nixon attended virtually none of those meetings. Really, and that's a shock because we all wow. assume we all assume that he did. Now that doesn't mean he wasn't talking to somebody in the CIA about them, or you know. But but here's another shocker: it appears that neither Nixon or Eisenhower they kind of launched the project. The the Cuba project was authorized by Eisenhower, signed off with an NSAM uh, action memo in, in April time frame. And basically all it said was, okay, you guys are gonna recruit Cuban exiles or you're gonna recruit, you're gonna take them off island, you're gonna train them, you're gonna put them back on island. And we know that Castro, you know, his, his regime has problems and they're gonna overthrow them. And this is all going, there was a target date. It's like the date is October. This is all going to be placed, but by the time of the election, there's going to be a widespread revolution ongoing on on the island and that's that's what nixon expected yeah you're right you're right because that's what had been promised but what we start seeing is in the in the september time frame 
you start seeing these, these they're not memoranda, but they're exchanges between Nixon and Eisenhower. And it's like, so what happened? Yeah, was it something supposed to have had? And Nixon really begins to lose it at that point in time because he's been, you know, he's, he's because Kennedy can campaign on Cuba against him. Yeah. But Nixon, because he's been briefed, can't say anything. And neither can Eisenhower. It's like, oh, we're totally neutral about Cuba. And Kennedy can go, well, that's wrong. So Kennedy campaigns about doing something in Cuba while the administration really is doing what Kennedy is talking about. And, and, and Nixon in his memoirs is totally bitter about A, he can't talk about it, and B, they, they didn't pull off the program. So it was, supposed to, it was supposed to succeed, yes, before the election. Someone told JFK about it. I'm trying to remember who it was. And that's how he used it in the, uh, the, yeah. the, the, the uh, television debates against Nixon. I'm trying to remember who. Well, he, he you, got a you, brief, and it, it may well have been. Was it, was it Dulles that briefed him? But I, it, normally it's Dulles, just like Dulles briefed Johnson uh, later. I mean, normally the CIA director briefs the presidential candidates. Now, is this is this Richard Dulles or Alan Dulles? Alan. Alan. Okay. Um, th- so I want you to take me to like the, the, the start before Kennedy took the administration um, ab- about this. But also, did, was this not like what was the president lineup before JFK took office like was it all right wing for the longest time and then there was a a, JFK was the first Democrat or something that get in there because what I've noticed is that and I think this is mentioned in Oliver's film was that they were very used to getting their way the um, the CIA all these seemed to be off on their own thing where the, the they all agreed on the same lineup. It's like having a bunch of yes men at your table. Everyone kind of knew what that was going on and how the direction they were heading in, which you can look through any of the government projects. The reason what they're not, there's drastic actions that were being taken. Now they are drastic, but it's also, that's how it's been going for a long time. So the drasticness really is normalized by now. And it, I mean, the way that I've kind of received it is the same thing with the way that they had in um, Africa with uh, Tamaboya where they gave um he wrote a letter like a very good letter to Kennedy during his administration saying like hey like uh none of these kids here in Africa are educated you know you expect us to you know fix our country but we can't with no education and that was kind of the thing was that the government united states at the time didn't really want to we kind of left them there. We, we were like, hey, you know, we're going to we're going to go back to our country. We'll give you a couple of years to fix yours. And if you don't, we're going to come over. We knew that without proper tools and proper resources, they weren't going to fix or they weren't going to you know, pull themselves out of the area that they're in. So then we would eventually go over there and take over. But then th- this Tom Aboya sent a letter to JFK that later was I think it was sent to Harvard or something. But JFK funded him one hundred thousand dollars to bring over some people to educate themselves and go back to their own country and one of those people that came over was obama's dad and then uh, robert i heard robert kennedy say that um when he spoke at an environmental rally in like 2004 he talked about meeting obama and obama talking about this situation that his dad or his uncle had done for all of his country and it kind of seems like with cuba for instance if we take that same example and go to cuba you already want your that dictator out and what's the best way to do that? The best military strategy is to get their own regime. You know, you supply them, you supply the revolutionaries or whoever to take out their that leader. And then it's now yours for the taking. Am I getting that right in any sense? Or is that? Generally speaking, yeah. So let's look at the Eisenhower. Eisenhower is a two-term president, right? So he's, he's the real post-war president. And he is a, a conservative Republican now. <laughs> the day he would be a very liberal Republican or a Democrat, but he was a conservative Republican. And, and the slogan of the time, you know, what is good for American business is good for America. So he was a business president. Uh, and, and basically the way American for, foreign policy operated at the time was business drove it. Corporate America drove it. Uh, Kennedy started to change that mix, but the way it really worked is there were two Dulles brothers. 
Allen and John Foster. And when there was a political situation overseas, especially when any foreign government, whether it's Iran in the Middle East or whether it's in South America, Latin America, or it's Guatemala, nobody wanted to do anything differently until it looked like the communists were going to take control of the government. Now, that was anathema. You know, reg regardless of what was driving it, that was anathema. So basically, American foreign policy consisted of Eisenhower letting John Foster Dulles use all the diplomatic forces at his command. He's, he's, he's head of state to prevent communists from taking over governments. If they did, then basically what happened was John Foster and Eisenhower went to Brother Allen and Brother Allen would overthrow that government and replace it with some something favorable to U.S. business interest. And I think that's where you're coming from, Rob. Mm -hmm. I mean, I mean, and, so, and e even if they weren't really communists, if they were oh, not, it didn't matter. They, they it just didn't matter, sound it didn't like matter if they yeah. were really communists. I mean, in, in Guatemala, you've got a, a populist, basically a, a president take charge who is, is for agrarian reform. His real sin is agrarian reform, which was, you know, that's all you needed. It's like agrarian reform means threatening American business interest. So yeah, you're right. It actually communism often was just a facade. So it just, yeah, I, I'm, I'm with you. Uh, <laughs> but, but that was the history. So you under the Eisenhower administration, that it actually worked. Okay. And I think it's important to remember that the CIA had had overthrown uh, a, a popular government in Iran and replaced it with somebody who was, you know, in favor of the American and British oil interest. They had overthrown an agrarian reformer in Guatemala and replaced it. And the CIA had done this and they had tried to do the same thing in Indonesia. And, but that had not really worked. I mean, some of the tactics they were using, you, you can only push so far, but they did have a history of, of like being almost magic actors. These, and, and they cultivated it. The CIA would plant these stories about how good they were. You know, and I, I quote some of them in my books, so like the, a story comes up and like the CIA director has this meeting in Switzerland with somebody. And the next thing that happens is the Iranian government is overthrown. Like they just pull these strings somehow. So the, they bu built a real mystique, Rob, with, with Eisenhower and he trusted them. And so when it came to Castro and overthrowing Castro, he really, Eisenhower, did trust that they knew how to do this stuff. They had a track record. So pretty much he, I mean, he, he, let's face it, he's an outgoing president, right? So if the CI says they can make this happen and make it happen in nine months, they've done it before. You know, he has other things to do. The vice president, has, they did, they really did trust them. I, I mean, I would, I would, we often talk about the fact that JFK trusted the CIA Gary, you know, Gary, you mentioned this. Well, so did Eisenhower and Nixon. They, they try, it's like everybody trusted them and they lied to everybody. I, I was, you, you mentioned they're lying to JFK. Gary, they lied to Eisenhower and Nixon just as much as JFK. But he didn't trust them anymore after the Bay of Pigs. That was this, it. <laughs> this is true. Yeah. Well, it was an object, but I, I, I just, it's important to realize that they were, they were, okay. So let, let's go back to, both Eisenhower and Nixon, when we get to October, November of 1960, have been mis misled. They're, they're not on board with what's happened. This whole plan that the CIA, uh, Richard Bissell and Tracy Barnes, Dulles didn't even get himself involved in it. I mean, he had, you know, as, as you mentioned, Gary, in the end, he wouldn't even be in town. Uh, Wait, so, so were they... In, were they uh, so created or were they established by what Eisenhower originally wanted with Cuba? And then they kind of evolved from there to go down their own thing to the point where Eisenhower and Nixon and everyone weren't keen on what the CIA was actually doing. Or did Eisenhower even want to know? Did he just say, I want this to happen? I don't care how it happens. And this is how it's going to happen. 
that, that is that's a fascinating question, Rob, because uh, he he didn't ask any questions. I want this to happen. They gave him a program. He didn't that, he didn't monitor it. I'm sorry, Gary. Go ahead. Plausible deniability. Well, it, it, that's true. And, and presidents, you know, the, if you want deniability, you can't know too much. You're right. So that, that's kind of standard practice. But here's the thing. And, and one of the most fascinating things, when we get to November, it's it's pretty clear that no revolution <laughs> happened. It's pretty clear that this whole project, the way it's been organized, is a fiasco. And it's not going to work. In, in October, they actually had hundreds of guys ready to infiltrate into Cuba. And then when they checked, they had no boats and they had no planes. They had no way to get them in. It, it, you could not find anything that was mismanaged more. But that's another story. Uh, so and that was a terrible uh, location for an invasion. Originally, oh, they were supposed to go somewhere else, weren't they? They were. They were, they were supposed to start it. Start it, trend it, but but I mean, even just to infiltrate. Forget, by November, they there was no, there was no brigade, there was no invasion. What really happened is, at the time of the election, they had to admit to themselves that they failed. So what are they going to tell the new mes new president? We're a bunch of incompetents. We promised your predecessor something, and we couldn't deliver it. No, what they do is over a space of about six weeks, they write an entirely new plan that Eisenhower, Eisenhower had never seen. It involves creating an amphibious landing force, uh, taking all these guys that had been trained to infiltrate and be guerrillas, and now we're training them to be organized infantry and heavy weapons and tank platoons. Now, th this is just a totally new plan it was never shared with Eisenhower. So by December, January, it's brand new. It, it's not the Cuba project. It's something new. Uh, they start talking to Eisenhower. And here's what is a fascinating thing. Eisenhower gives them this great out. Eisenhower says, look, I know it's been challenging. I know it's been difficult. I tell you what, CIA, you know, kind of, it's, it's too much for you, right, guys? So all I want you to do is I want you to create a provocation. I want you to set up some kind of a false flag. I want you to do something so I can send the Army and Navy in. So Eisenhower, before Kennedy comes into office, there's like a 90-day window, and Eisenhower is willing to go for a full-fledged military engagement with Cuba as long as the CIA sets it up. And guess what? The CIA won't do it. Now, you, you also, you got to wonder, it's like, is Eisenhower, not, does the president not get to say, CIA, I want you to do this? No, they just don't do it. Uh, and it's like, why would they not do it? That's so stupid. You get, get the whole thing off your back. You know, you just failed. So there's a lot of hubris and there's a lot of, the, the CIA is, begins to act as if it doesn't care you know it what it what it wants it can make happen regardless of what the president offers and the same thing when kennedy comes into office and asks for their plan and they go well, we don't have anything in writing you know uh kennedy says like i want something in writing we don't do things around here with that something right but kennedy for the next three months before the bay of pigs on multiple occasions literally says to the CIA, let's cancel this. It, it's too dangerous. It's no way deniable. Just tell me you can't do it. Tell me we can stop it. I'm, I'm perfectly good with stopping it. And they won't say that, which kind of argues against all of this. All of these things like they know it's going to fail. Are they just in denial? Are they just consumed with hubris like we can make anything happen because he keeps offering them the out why would you not take it <laughs> and they didn't keep it a secret everybody knew it was coming i mean castro was ready he had his army ready and he knew it was no secret it was botched it was so badly botched <laughs> from day one 
that it could never succeed and they knew it they knew it couldn't succeed i'm sure of it well how much pu- how much how much did the public know about this situation that was going on like in the beginning the media was even writing about it saying we had we were training troops in where was it nicaragua we were training these troops and and, and oh, yeah. i mean it, it was no surprise so you, you could th- you couldn't read the papers in miami and not know this wasn't happening you know and and there were there were reporters going to guatemala and nicaragua and yeah th- Rob, this was, it was no secret that something big was going to happen. Now, but I want to, I want to know in specific, what do you, does anybody know what reports were being written by them? Or are they just, what is it inflating Castro's dominance on a factor of, you have this mad dictator that needs to be, you know, handled with, or needs to be our prime focus on? Because what I'm getting from the CIA and what I have picked up from the CIA, not just from this, but from Watergate, from so many other covert action, uh, 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 really their capacity to expand what I would call overcroaching any aspect of what the CIA should be about. Um, a lot of it is their involvement in, let's say, the Cuba project, Bay of Pigs, whatever you want to say, any activity that they've ever done. It They have a bravado about them, which is I have a lot of power and I'm really good at making things go the way that I want things to go. And if you're telling me that the reason why they get, were given so many outs and they say no to them or they're saying no is because they realize that's going to be a bigger mark on their record, a loss rather than if it's a win. Their win won't be talked about a lot, but their actually their win would be even more effective if it, they weren't if their name wasn't even in, attached to the document. That's how good of a strategy they want. But if you're saying that they need to back down and they're, you're giving them an out saying, it's okay, guys, you failed on this one. We'll get them the next time. No, because anytime you need something done, you're not going to let this little thing go out of our record. It's going to constantly stay in there and it's going to be a mark on our whole entire society. That's why with Watergate, when William Colby exposed all the bad things that they were doing, every single document and every single report and every single story, HBO, whatever you want to say, says the CIA would never recover from this. And that is a quote from one of the directors that were involved in there. And it does get to be a turf war. I think you described that very well. I mean, the CIA throughout the Eisenhower administration had been taking over more and more military actions more and more covert military actions. The CIA had had effectively created its own air force. The CIA had come up with practices to literally, uh, I won't call draft, but detail officers from the military to CIA operations. That was already happening in Southeast Asia a lot in Laos and and Vietnam. The, The CIA was, the CIA, it was, not just spying on people. It wasn't just collecting intelligence. It wasn't, it was becoming a real paramilitary force. And so if they had essentially said, oh, well, no, we we can't do Cuba, it would have been ceding a big piece of turf to the military, which as you said, uh, Gary, is what happened because immediately after the Bay of Pigs, JFK started taking military operations away from the CIA. So there's always that turf battle. You know, Rob, you said, yeah, yeah, they were anything but humble in the first place. And B, they never want to give up any turf. So, but here's the other thing. They knew something that JFK didn't know. And and here's the wild card. Uh, Gary, you mentioned deniability. There were four things going on in the 90 days before the Bay of Pigs that could have taken the whole thing another direction. First off, they were they thought, and they had it pretty well set up, actually, they had two different plans to kill Castro. One to poison him, which would have worked, actually. I mean, it, it would have worked other than Howard Hunt locking up the people that were to give the orders to deliver the poison. But okay, so they had a, a plan to poison him well thought out and actually well operational. They had another plan for a sniper attack, which is was actually pretty well thought out too. In addition to that, and this is something we really only know now, um, like in the last decade, they had set up a false flag operation against Guantanamo base. They were going to stage an attack against Guantanamo using Cuban exiles 
that had been infiltrated through Guantanamo with explosives acting with another con in conjunction with another team that was going to be landed in that area of the island. As soon as that happened, and, and JFK knew nobody outside the CIA and the Navy knew this, Navy intelligence knew this was going on. The chief of Atlantic forces had deployed a carrier group, a full scale super carrier group uh, off Cuba. JFK did not know about that. And that group, and I've actually talked to people that were on the show, that, that group was in position. That carrier group all by itself could have taken the island. I mean, it, this when I say a super carrier group, this is a nuclear carrier group with all the assets that go with it. Castro would have been helpless in the face of that. And and if Guantanamo had been attacked, the admiral had the authority and would have executed the authority. And actually, because I found it, is on record in the Naval Institute with interviews saying he was prepared to do that. So is that the part CIA, of Northwoods? Well, you know what? Like, like a minor, a minor a provocation. The, the funny thing is the Navy and the CIA we think they said no to ice historically they said no to eisenhower when he said stage of provocation i would say we know now that they actually said yes they just didn't tell eisenhower and they just didn't tell kennedy and bissell went ahead and set up this provocation the reason it didn't happen is it is just so sad i mean we, i don't say sad but the explosives that were to be used in the attack had to be taken out at Guantanamo covertly. And then they tra were training the guys. They had an accident and they blew up all the explosives, <laughs> injured several of the Cuban exiles, the, the pack mules that were carrying anyway. But well, I guess what I'm trying to get across is some of the things that sound terribly stupid to us, like why would you not take the out the president is offering you? Well, if you're someone with a lot of hubris, like Bissell was, who feels he can do no wrong, he's going to show you how good he is. Mm, yeah, I, I'm not going to give off turf. This is going to work. Now, afterwards, when it doesn't work, you look nothing stupid, right? But well, uh, the the main thing is is when you look at not only that aspect of not backing down or not trying to accept maybe a mark on your record as the CIA or whatever you want to say, it's also an aspect of how influenced or what have they been doing that they haven't been telling the president, which now if they back away, are they leaving a lot of weaponry there? Are they leaving a lot of other materials and other substances there for actions that they have planned on to do that they think is going to succeed? I mean, you have to write fucking reports on half of this shit. And I'm wondering, is the president asking for the reports? But one thing, uh, Gary, you said Operation Northwoods. Now, Operation War Northwoods was to blow up a Cuban airliner. Or well, no, something. it had a lot of it had a, the idea behind it was to have a, a, a national a, a terrible event happen a, uh, at, and blame it on Cuba, like killing an official or shooting down an airplane or uh, kijacking. Well, they, they, had a plane, plane, they had a plane. They had a plane set up. They had a plane set up to do. Yeah, I the, mean, the there North wasn't. An, I don't think there was one there was several versions of it and uh and and i think what i really think jfk's shooting was northwood that's that's what northwoods was blame it on Castro. that's what they were trying to do blame it on castro so that we well, would invade castro we we do have to keep the timeline northwoods happened after the bay of pigs it did not uh, northwoods 60, was 62. a contingency plan it was right. 62 yeah okay it was uh, it was a contingency plan submitted under Project Mongoose to, in any event, but, but, it, but you're right, it was a whole set of, these are things that we could do that will force us to act against Cuba. Now, they didn't actually, they didn't actually proceed with any of them, but this is, so that's the only reason I said, you know, what we're talking about here is this provocation at Guantanamo is, is the same sort of thing. I mean, ab absolutely it is. It just that it came earlier. 
Larry, I wanted to ask you about, did you ever hear of this one, a plot to kill Castro? And I can't remember where I read about it. Um, it was a CIA plan to kill Castro. They had one plan where, and this is really ironic and scary. Uh, Castro had a favorite restaurant that he ate in, okay? And it had a pantry. And what they were gonna do was after Castro ate, he always came back to congratulate the chef in the pantry. And they were gonna have a gunman like Sirhan shoot him in the pantry. And that is, that, that just uh, gets me because maybe they use that plan later against Bobby. Well, Did I you do know about that. I do know that the poison yeah. was supposed to be delivered right. by a way of his favorite restaurant by a chef yeah. who would take it out of the pantry. I I haven't I haven't heard about the gunplay, but there's no doubt that that's his favorite restaurant, and they had co-opted the chef, and and it was going to be the the food was going to be taken poisoned in the pantry and taken to him. You know, it, so. But I, I, I have to, I'll try to find maybe they, that. Maybe I they, uh, I, it's possible that they talked <laughs> about doing that when the poison didn't get delivered. It's kind of like, what are we going to do? The only okay, let's just put him in the pantry. <laughs> the only assassination attempt I know about is Operation Artichoke, which they thought they were going to destroy a vehicle or blow up a vehicle that was going to be Castro or not Castro. Yeah, Castro's. And it wasn't, it was his ambassador. Oh, they had lots of them. They had the one with the exploding seashell, and they had one where they were going to put um, they had six hundred and ninety diseases counts. diseases in his. Uh, they were going to give him a diving suit, and it was supposed to have uh, disease uh, bacteria in it to kill him with. Then there was Marina Lorenz. She had the poison pill. She she put him in the uh, cold cream, and they dissolved. <laughs> and, and there's plenty of time because. The first ones that we know about, the the actual poison for the pre-Bay of Pigs poisoning. I mean, so it starts in 1960 and it's still going on in 1963. So it's not like there's not plenty of time to come up with alternative poison plots uh, or 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 sniper attacks or or whatever. Yeah, this was kind of like an ongoing, an ongoing thing. But so to well, hold on. before we get to the thing, I wanted to go back to what I was talking about Northwoods, for instance, now with Northwoods, was that just a, when you were going to blame Cuba for that? Was that a way of getting the public to support uh, a, an invasion of Cuba? If you were able to publicize that there was a bunch of people dying, because I know when Kennedy saw the papers for Operation Northwoods, he said it was it was a terrible idea. It was just, it was ridiculous. It was crazy. And I, I go, all right. So even if the president doesn't agree with that and thinks that this is a stupid plan and he probably is going to end up knowing about it. Even if it does succeed, you're still going to have the general public that you can't let know about it being a planned thing, or this wasn't actually Cuba. Cause then you're going to come off as like a bad government for trying to create a, a provocateur act that is going to be blamed on Cuba. So then it's going to force Kennedy to have to go in there, or he's going to seem like a president that's not doing anything. And either way, they get him out of office on well, that yeah, aspect. Of things. Yeah. yeah. Larry, do you, was that, uh, was Northwood's uh, joint chiefs plan or CIA or both? It basically it was, here's what happened when they created my, the, the Mongoose Project, okay? Uh, Kennedy, Kennedy by that time, after the Bay of Pigs, had, had done two things. He had started a program to start switching all covert paramilitary operations to the military. It was called, quote unquote, switchback. And he implemented it first in Vietnam. By the summer of 1963, he had already issued a directive that the, that the Joint Chiefs we're going to take over covert operations against Cuba. Okay, so so he was already he was already doing that. But as as part of the as part of this, basically decided he was never going to let the CIA have a political action covert action project all to themselves again. So he would always create a committee of State Department and Joint Chiefs and the CIA for any regime change project. And, and we have to, it wasn't that Kennedy was against regime change. I mean, I mean he, he did carry on regime change against Cuba. 
So basically Northwoods, the, the, within the military who was gonna inherit you know, covert operations against Cuba, they started making contingency plans. And, and I think a, a lot of people, and, and Kennedy, a, a, he thought Northwoods was stupid. Okay, that, but he, he did support the fact that military operations were in, off the table. Actually, in the summer of 1963, he authorized a major military amphibious landing project that was a duplicate of invading Cuba. I mean, it, it's like they use Castro's names backwards. Uh, it actually in the Atlantic, in the Caribbean, they were the only thing they didn't do. They assembled the force. They went through all the Navy exercises. The amphibious landing itself was canceled because there was a hurricane. And, and so they didn't actually practice a landing. But he, he had the military option still on the board. Now, this is the, the timing of that is real important because that's just before he started into his back channel dialogue with, with Castro. But anyway, in, in any of your, your question, Northwoods was a, a Joint Chiefs staff study, contingency plans. How do we how do we create a provocation that, that justifies an actual invasion? What's your take on the Am World uh, thing, where there was supposed to be another invasion of Cuba in December '63 or? early um, January. Uh, whose book was that? That was and that's uh, Lamar Waldron. My Lamar former Waldron. Buddy. What's my your buddy? take on that? He was just wrong. I, I hate to say this, but uh, Lamar and I were both studying Amworld at the same point in time. And actually, Lamar came to me and said, Larry, would you please not write about Amworld until I get my book out? <laughs> and I said, OK, I won't do that, Lamar. We both lived in Atlanta. And he, the, the problem that that suffered with is that the is the same problem that all researchers get. He had like this many documents on Amworld. And so he made an estimate of what was going on. I now have this many documents on Amworld and wrote about it, like devoted a major portion of one of my books to it. We know all about Amworld. Amworld didn't actually even get organized and start military operations until like April of 64. It, it, they, they were still starting, they were just starting to buy stuff and move people out of the U.S. in November, December. It, it would have been impossible to do what Lamar was talking about. Robbie, what we're talking about, I don't know if you're familiar with Amworld. Um, Ramal, uh, Lamar Waldron wrote a book. It was a very good book, very well uh, researched. And he came up with the idea that Bobby Kennedy was planning another invasion of Cuba. And they had a guy named, uh, a guy named Cubella who was on um, Castro's immediate staff that was going to kill Castro for them when they did this invasion to, to coincide with the invasion. And the, the reason Bobby Kennedy was keeping this secret, he, he didn't want anyone to know about it and uh, because the mafia was supposedly uh, had uh, found out about all the stuff before and he didn't want them to know about it. But it's a complicated thing and it makes kind of a lot of sense, but I'd never read anything about it anywhere before. And, and I don't, you know, I wanted what Larry thought because uh, he's, he's more of an expert on the Cuban thing. And, and it did make sense at the time. I mean, it, it's, we get trapped into that sort of thing, you know, basically you take what you've got and yeah, Bobby was behind Amworld. Uh, Amworld was Robert Kennedy's project. And, and the really strange thing is in 1963, at the same time, Bobby was pushing Amworld as a deniable way to overthrow Castro. His brother is starting this <laughs> back channel negotiation <laughs> with Castro yeah. and, and very likely would have brought it off, but it, it just shows you how complex yeah. things can get. Now, I was think, Ken, well, was Kennedy I really sure? think that uh, that's why he was killed more than anything else was that he was starting to negotiate with Castro. The Cubans were 
and that he was going back door to Kennedy over the Joint Chiefs, over the CIA and everything. And you don't go over their heads. They, you know, and if you, they did not want peace with Castro. They did not want. That's, that's, that, that's my main thing is, was he trying to negotiate peaceful terms or was he trying to remove Castro from office as well too? Cause I, 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 th- I always thought that was strange. I'm like, he's meeting with Castro and then you have Castro talking about or making an announcement and a statement and a document as well too, released in the 2021 um, JFK uh, documents that were released staying like it was a statement about mourning for jfk and it was just like this is very weird i mean you have a a person who says he's responsible for the bay of pigs debacle and the whole issue with that but then you look and you see that he's negotiating terms separate from the cia and his own you know chiefs of staff where you start going is this one of the giant strikes that might have got him assassinated i i think well jfk wanted peace he, he wanted peace and he'd Ken- do it Kennedy, either way. Yeah, Kennedy, two things everybody has to appreciate about JFK. A, he really did want peace. I mean, uh, he, he, was very, he was very concerned about anything that could tip the scales to nuclear war. I mean, the Cuban Missile Crisis had done that. So he really did. He, he, the interesting thing is he was one of our only presidents who felt that the United States' position in the world was actually strong enough so that we could win on a, a level playing field. You know, we did not have to keep doing all this covert stuff. Uh, but the other thing is, he was a pragmatist. It's sort of like, you know, he's going into an election in 1964. Cuba's a big deal. Vietnam is a big deal. Else, so he's going to have to come up with, with a way to deal with that. So he's still got a couple of courses of action open. But and then Castro approaches him. I mean. Castro approaches him and says, you know, I'm fed up with the Russians. Can we do some kind of a deal? It, it's it's JFK all over the place. And you can imagine what would have happened. Think what would have happened to the world if JFK had brought those negotiations off. Cuba goes neutral, kicks out the Russians. We relieve the embargo. And with that history behind him, JFK does the same thing in Vietnam. But he, they didn't want peace. What, uh, yeah, the, the, I, I, the, C, the I, CIA, the military, none of them wanted that. He's uh, the only one that wanted. Helms most definitely was doing everything he could to undermine JFK. Uh, so yeah, I, I. But Robbie, Robbie, your 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 question was was JFK bipolar, and the answer <laughs> is to some extent yes. <laughs> he, he he was not a humble guy either. It's kind of like. Actually, there's a conversation where somebody wrote about later. It's kind of like had a conversation with JFK and says, how can you do both things at once? And JFK says, well, I can, you know, <laughs> like, well, and the guy says, you know, that could be dangerous. <laughs> like, yeah, well, part, of, part of it was to to show a hard uh, stance for his, you know, for the military and for everybody else. But he wanted peace. I mean, he he would have. He'd do whatever it takes to, you know, but I want to ask you a question. How old were you during the uh, Cuban Missile Crisis? Uh, in 1962, I was, uh, I thought you were asking, I would have been a freshman in high school. Okay. And Rob is going, nobody is that old. I, I can see that. <laughs> well, I can see I, that expression on his face. I was a junior. <laughs> uh, and I, I have to tell you this, and, you know, this is the thing. And you, you, you know, you, you can't convince people of this, but here's my take. I lived through that missile crisis. And let me tell you, we never came so close to the end of the world. I mean, I, I was running cross country and everyone on the starting line was looking at the sky, expecting Russian bombers or missiles any minute. I mean, it was that terrifying. Now I wanna tell you this, And this is what I always try to put across to people who weren't born or or don't remember that because they don't know how bad it was. But if it wasn't for JFK, none of us would be alive today. I'm convinced of that. What would Nixon have done? He'd have invaded Cuba, bombed Cuba, nuclear war. What would I, what would, uh, what would, would any president, the only one that might not have is maybe Carter. 
<laughs> but all of them would have listened to their advisors, to their military advisors, and they all wanted to uh, take those missile sites out, invade Cuba. And now we know that they had a tactical nuclear weapons aimed at our forces. If we would have invaded, they'd have launched, we'd have launched, the Russians would have launched. And, and I think that JFK came to a new understanding during that crisis where he said, wait a minute, it's not about who's the strongest, who's controlling the world. It's about our children and surviving the next generation. And that became his. Well, that led to a speech about peace where he talked about we breathe yeah, the, the same that air. Speech. And I think Khrushchev saw the same thing and they, they managed to save the world by, wait a minute, let's not listen to our advisors. Let's find a way out of this mess. I, I, I don't give them that much credit. I think that's an accidental thing. I don't think they knew that there, nobody knew, I don't think what, that there were nuclear uh, missile strikes about to happen if they were going to do something in the I first think so. place. I think they knew it. I don't think they didn't know that until afterwards. I think that was just like, oh, well, good you thing mean, we didn't You mean that, the, that, the, that they had missiles in Cuba aimed at our forces? Yeah, I think no, that was just we, accidental. But we didn't know that then, you know, but. But I mean, well, but it's an unintended. It's an unintended thing where it was like, oh, good thing we didn't do that, or they would have just launched it at us. And then well, it now we know that. Thing. Yeah, but yeah. those people like Curtis LeMay, <laughs> they called him a traitor for not. He didn't care if they forty million people died, Americans died. We would win. That's what he cared about. Well, JFK knew one other thing, Rob, and I think this is, again, JFK had been in the military, okay, and. And this is a quote, okay. What JFK understood was nobody can count on being in charge. And his expression was, there is always going to be some son of a bitch who doesn't get the right word. And what JFK understood is no matter what desk you set behind, no matter where you are, you're not nearly as much in control of the situation as you think you are. And that's what he that's what he knew from personal experience when all his advisors would say, OK, we can do this, this and this and it'll work this way. And JFK knew that nothing ever works that perfectly. So he might not have known the details, as you're saying, but what he did know was what he didn't know. I, I, that's the important thing. He knew that you can't be totally in control of a situation. Well, you can't. I think he was able to think one step ahead a lot and evaluate all the possibilities. If he did this, he didn't jump into anything. He, he'd say, if I do this, then they're going to, it's like a chess game. They're going to do this if, or this could happen or that could happen. Did you, uh, do you know the story about that nuclear submarine that the Russians had? That is incredible to me. I don't know if you know this, Robbie, uh, when they did the quarantine, uh, they stopped the Russian ships, but there were a couple nuclear submarines that they didn't even know were there. And so uh, the Russian submarines had these nuclear weapons. And the way the system worked was, two, was it two, the, the captain of the ship and the uh, KGB, common, officer. KGB officer on the ship had to agree, had to both agree to push, to sign the missile. To fire the missile. Well, they dropped depth charges trying to get it to uh, surface, and the captain wanted to launch the, the missile, and the KGB uh, commissar didn't let him. Actually, I think it's the reverse. <laughs> Maybe the it was the commissar reverse. wanted to off the. Okay, I had, read, the captain, I had the captain said no. I think I said uh -huh. I thought it was the captain, but it could have been. But just imagine if he had launched that missile. <laughs> it's all over. It's all over. Well, and, and again, that's what Kennedy knew from wartime experience, combat experience. Yeah, it just you. There are things you don't know, and there are things that you can't control. And and I will say, okay, this is an example. And if we can kind of go back to the Bay of Pigs, okay, here's that that lesson was, I won't say confirmed to him, but I said one of the things about Kennedy was that he was a pragmatist. He would change to a certain extent. I mean, he, he understood real-time command and control. And so I, I think you mentioned this, Rob, and, and that like one of the questions is, what did the CIA not tell 
JFK about the landings at the Bay of Pigs, okay? Did it, what they did not tell them, we, we discussed these like poisoning and shooting and carrier, you know, provocative actions. Table that they talk had stuff, table talk. Play. Okay, but here's the other thing they didn't tell them. So as I told you before, JFK's order was that this landing be totally deniable, okay? Ships, ships offshore, you know, no Americans in combat, all of this sort of stuff. The Joint Chiefs, actually, JFK demanded, required that the Joint Chiefs do an evaluation of the CIA's plan, okay? The Joint Chiefs did, and the Joint Chiefs evaluation says two things. First of all, yeah, you can land a force. Yeah, you can do that. We're, we're, not, <laughs> we're not saying you should. We're not saying you shouldn't. You, you can land a force. That force will not be able to maintain, quote unquote, as a lodgement. They won't be able to maintain their position on the beach for more than a couple of weeks, unless two or three other things happen. There has to be a major island uprising, okay, in support of it to divert troops. Uh, your whole plans for supply chain are so stupid, we can hardly believe it. So two weeks is about all that you're going to get. But you won't have those two weeks unless you have total control of the air. The report itself, the Joint Chiefs report, air, air staff report says, if there is a single Cuban aircraft operational over the Bay of Pigs, you're going to lose your supply ship, at least one. You've got all of your ammo and all your supplies on two ships, and you're done. It, it says that right there, okay? So it's not that the Joint Chiefs weren't being, and the CIA knew that. Okay, so the, the CIA knows this. So here's what the CIA doesn't tell JFK. First of all, JFK has, has told them to get those ships. The ships are never to be visible or under attack. They're to be gone before daylight. <clears throat> what they don't tell them is, that one of the things that the ships have to do is land a tank brigade, an American tank brigade. No, now, no. now, wait a minute. Think, think about this. Okay. Eisenhower and, and JFK have said there you can leave no evidence that the United States is supporting this invasion. And they failed to tell JFK that they're going to land mainline. This is not surplus stuff. These are mainline American tanks on the beach. <laughs> You like, might as well build a McDonald's there. Yeah, it's just there like, okay, I think we just passed deniability somewhere along the way. Um, but you also, they've interviewed, afterwards they interviewed the commanders and everybody, and nobody ever could conceive that they could offload those tanks, loaded trucks. Nobody ever thought they could get those ships out of there by daylight. Well, okay. Can I ask you? And Bissell, the, the big sin is Bissell. After the first attacks, before the landings, Bissell knows that half of the Cuban Air Force is still operational. And he still doesn't go to JFK and say, stop, wait. Half of their aircraft, sure, they're going to have aircraft over the beach. We're doomed. You know, like, okay, send the Navy carriers in and maybe I can pull it off. So it, it's all... The other thing they don't tell JFK is, oh, by the way, Mr. President, uh, Castro's security forces just wrapped up and rolled up all of the Cuban exile group, or the guerrilla groups on the island last month. There will be no uprising. They're, they're, they're in prison. There, there are thousands of them in prison. They don't tell them that. Even if not, they were in the mountains. And how did they get to the swamps, through the swamps? <laughs> <from> the <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> and, and there was no cordon. And uh, this is a great, it's great. The CIA says, operations officers keep absolutely secret from all the guerrilla groups that we're going to be landing. Like, oh, oh okay. Now, now, don't, don't guys, don't sneak in and try to, like, attack those Cuban troops on the way to the beach. You know, we, we don't want you to know. So. It's it, the level of mismanagement, stupidity, bungling that, that is often attributed to JFK. This was so bad that when the CIA's own inspector general wrote up an evaluation of the Bay of Pigs, 
He blamed it 100% on the CIA's own management, on Richard Bissell, on Tracy Barnes. And it was so embarrassing that the CIA would only let like eight copies of that be printed. And they let Bissell write his own rebuttal to it. Kind of like, wait a minute. No, this is not how life is supposed to work. And they let, what's worse is it was only in like 1994 when we saw enough of the documents to know that the two actual military, CIA military officers, um, Easterline and, and Hawkins had gone to Bissell and resigned before the landings. They essentially resigned and said, unless you can get the president to triple the number of airstrikes and maintain Navy air cover over the beach during the landing, uh, we're out of here because this is gonna be a disaster. <clears throat> and Richard Bissell told them he would go to the president and do that. What Richard Bissell did was to go to the president and agree to further reduce the airstrikes. And these two guys after the Bay of Pigs essentially told all of their officers and all the Cubans that it was JFK's decision. And when they were shown these documents in 1994, <clears throat> the words that they have for Richard Bristle are strong to say the least. Well, so there was line, I guess what I'm saying is there was line up to JFK, there was lying down within the force itself. Well, the truth will set you free. Can I can I ask, <laughs> can I ask what you think would be the most logical reason of why they had such a mismanagement of it? And when I ask about that is, do you think that it was the director's fault? Do you think that he just was way too disattached from maybe an aspect of what the CIA was doing? Maybe he thought he had a bunch of different plans going on. Like, for instance, how many military generals know exactly what's happening at the front lines of battle? So you're just making calls and sending out troops without really understanding what you're doing and knowing how much you might lose and how much you might gain only because you're so detached from the battlefield. I, 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 I look at that angle. I keep that in mind. But I also keep in mind. I mean, were they already not liking JFK? And if you think about all the operations that you've been doing, and now you're having doubts about doing these operations, mostly because it right now it's not looking so good on your end, this might not be a success, it's going to be might be a failure, would it be easier just to blame it on your president? Because what I've noticed through talking with some other JFK uh, researchers, especially Richard Bartholomew, he mentioned about the next 15 years or so after JFK's assassination was the amount of articles that came out talking about the slandering of the man's character based on infidelity practices, which I brought up in a conversation with him about Marilyn Monroe. Now I can understand that perspective because all this information, the reason why, Larry, you messaged me saying we should do a podcast about the Cuba project and the Bay of Pigs invasion was because it's 50 years after now and we're now starting to get more information that hasn't been told in before and you start getting into this aspect of like you're starting to see kind of some true light come out of it after at the time when all of this was really really relevant you didn't get that information instead you got people caring about the assassination which they should but also you saw a slander of articles coming out about the man's character that has deflamed it in such a way where now people I, I i think you talk around groups around my age and groups that are probably a little bit older or grew up in that time period with jfk they'll tell you he was a great president he was a great president yeah, but what was being reported back then, 1970, 1965, 1975, I looked it up. There weren't really a lot of talks about the assassination anymore. It was more about digging into the man's backstory in history. Yeah, well, that's, that's character that's assassination. A, that's what it, it was character assassination. And I think that's a really good question. And I can give a couple of very specific answers. Thank God. We know. <laughs> We know specifically, and I, and I talk about this in the book, In Denial, I, I, we know specifically that there were a series of articles planted after the Bay of Pigs in major media publications, because we can trace who the reporters who we're talking to, and they all came from Richard Bissell, unnamed CIA source. Bissell sent out on his own personal crusade to blame the disaster on JFK. Cover your the guy, that Kennedy, the guy that Kennedy fired. Yeah. 
Cover your <laughs> so, ass. That's what it is. It's so cover I, your ass. Absolutely. And I think to some extent it was it was see why I, I personally think Bissell became unhinged and he was in he wasn't he he would not bear his own responsibility. So he had to project yeah. it on yeah. somebody. That was so, but revenge. That, he, he got revenge. Well, so that, when we talk about extended. covert action, when we talk about covert action, though, I mean, besides, I'm going to ask about going into a little bit more detail. Like, this is all covert action, but I mean, other types of covert action as well, too. And is it just the CIA that is capable of covert action type abilities, or is there other covert action type abilities, like with FBI and all of these other intelligence agencies? Because from my perspective, just a, 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 you know, looking back into all the history and all the stuff that we know now, I'm not trying to Monday night quarterback, but everyone seems like they have their own fucking leash like they're all just running off and doing their own things and nobody's letting anybody know anything about this i think i mentioned this in our panel episode about um everyone's depiction of how the assassination of jfk went fbi said a shooter from the back cia mentioned and speculated a shooter from the front and then the warren commission just completely just kind of fumbled the whole thing but you get into this aspect of like these are FBI and CIA, they are, they have some incredible power that probably we don't even know the full extent into when it comes to like MK ultra and other government projects that are out there as well, too, where I start going, are they just like, I mean, slowly just have the mind of their own. And now they feel like at this point, maybe they don't have to tell the president every single thing that they're doing because the president probably doesn't care to know. And I think that starts with Eisenhower as well, too. His lack of wanting to know what they're doing, that only incentivizes that behavior to continue to where next thing you know, wait, the president wants to know what we're fucking doing? Like, no. No. Well, that's that is the reason the reason I wrote the book in denial. It's not all about the Cuba project. It really asked the fundamental question: Why do we continue, or why did we continue to do deniable operations? Why why did we think a Why did we think that they would be nobody would know when they always did? <laughs> There's none of these operations that we did. Everybody knew the Americans were behind them. You know, and so everybody knew. Why did we ever think deniability was a thing? But to, to answer your question, I would say the big difference is the, the CIA, you, you look at all those other agencies, and the only agency that actually issued a, a PR piece having to do with the JFK assassination. In other words, here is a piece of literature that says when people challenge the Warren Commission, when people talk about the a possible conspiracy, here's our talking points. The CIA actually issued a document like that. The CIA is used to influencing public opinion. They're, they're, they're the ones that, I mean, it's part of their job overseas. I mean, it is really. That's If you want to do political action, that's a big part of your, your job. <clears throat> the CIA, two things. First of all, they immediately knew after Kennedy's assassination that they had an opportunity to re kind of like retake the position that they'd had with Eisenhower and do it with Johnson. And they did, which is which is how I one of the strangest things is Kennedy authorized a commission to investigate the Bay of Pigs. It's called the Taylor Commission. And the Taylor Commission's report essentially said, do not let the CIA ever run a paramilitary operation again. Alan Dulles actually signed off on that statement and said, you know, we're not, we're not good at this. We shouldn't do this anymore. Okay. So this, this would, you would think this is like a national directive. Do not, do not do this anymore. This is, this goes into print in, in like 1962. And then by 1964, 1965, we have the entire country of Laos turned over to the CIA to run as a gigantic paramilitary operation. Clearly, there was an opportunity to retake the kind of influence that they'd had and do it with Johnson. So they needed kind of like a PR initiative to rebound because otherwise, well, they would have been left with nothing other than like to do spy stuff. You know, you'd think that would be exciting enough, but apparently not. 
they really liked running military operations, Vietnam, Southeast Asia. So I think to, to respond to your question, Rob, it is the CIA. Yeah, the CIA did knowingly, I think, I, I don't you would call it slandering. They certainly undermined JFK's image, reputation, to kind of take away what he had done to them, which was, which is actually to move them back to where uh, Truman had essentially, Truman never thought that the CIA would be doing military operations. Never, ever. And Kennedy was in the process. To, some people call it breaking apart. What he was really doing is taking all the covert ops and military ops and giving it back to the military. He was breaking that part off, which is Truman had never anticipated that. Um, so it, it was kind of like, how do we reassert ourselves? Well, we've got to make ten, Kennedy's not a good decision maker, right? Ken, Kennedy's, you know, let, let's, you can call it slander. And I, I, I do think a lot of those stories, I know some of those stories were planted by the CIA. There's just absolutely no doubt about that. Uh, and the, the officers, think about this just for a minute. We're, we're in the same position today. We would, what power did the CIA really have? The only power the CIA really had was media access. If you're in a position to let certain media people know secrets, you've got leverage. <clears throat> and those media people will write what you want them to write as long as they maintain access to you. And the CIA played that brilliantly. Yep. Mockingbird. Yeah. I hate to change the subject. Have you seen the Ruth Payne uh, video that just came out? Uh, I've seen about it. I have not seen it. How yeah. she's not CIA? Yeah, yeah. It's pretty interesting. Um, I watched it the other night. It's called JFK assassination and mrs Payne, or something like that she's they actually they actually got these interviews with her i'm sure they paid her well she's living in california in a nursing home a lot. kind of a retirement home okay with old people you know? and amazingly the guy went to the nursing home or it's, it's, like i said it's it's the retirement home he went there and he was filming her and guess who was there michael Payne. <laughs> they had been divorced didn't, for years didn't they have a problem or something i seem to remember i i, I it's like it's probably well, staring at her with a gun like you better shut <laughs> no he um he was just there like hey <laughs> you were hanging out together again and he was kind of <laughs> dementia yeah. he, he was he was a little bit not there you know that's how you get the but, secrets what I don't think I'd that. interview anybody my age or older right now and expect to be like, okay, tell me what really happened. Um, well, okay, yeah, right. He's dead now. But this went when he shot this film, he was still alive. Well, here's the thing. They're asking her the same questions, you know, and she's lying through her teeth. I mean, she's got this smile like, oh, come on, you know. Uh, Oswald did it and all this stuff. And then she was cued every time she talked about certain things, she cried. It was like, and, and this is 50, 60 years later. And back in the old interviews they showed, she cried at the same place in the interview. <laughs> Consistency is good. You want, and it's like, hey. oh, you have documents that show that my sister worked for the CIA? I didn't know. <laughs> You don't know your sister and your father and your brother-in-law work for the CIA. Well, that's I mean, that's one of the most interesting things about the CIA is that their disinformation or their manip manipulative strategies or covert capabilities, whatever you want to call, they were never supposed to take action on U.S. soil. And somehow I think that line has been stretched to where it has been affecting on U.S. soil. And we see that with documents and so much stuff that comes out now talking about, oh, he was a CIA agent. It's like, what the fuck? Like you're in this position right now where I get the military strategy. I really do. And this is what I need to express to anybody out there listening that thinks this sounds like all conspiracy talk. It is the best military strategy and the public will accept it. If you say that some type of crazy dictator overseas military wise, or you put it on the 
the media and say he's a problem. He's doing all this horrible things. Any rational person seeing it in that type of way is going to want a full invasion and want that person taken out to save those people that are being abused. Now, the issue becomes is when they level that person a threat, what stops them from labeling someone like fucking JFK a threat? If JFK did become a threat with his type of style of being the president, which did not fit the narrative of how it's been going for so fucking long. That to me is what I've received out of every single chat so far. He was a threat to their power. That's what he was a threat to. He was going to tear him down. He, he, yeah, they were losing all their power. He was taking it away. But, but one more thing I want to say about that. And this is, makes me sick, these documentaries. You know when you see Gerald Posner, Priscilla McMillan, and Max Holland in the video, that <laughs> I think I'll throw up if I see them again. That there's an agenda? <laughs> is that what you're now, saying? Gr gr granted, they had Jim DiEugenio, they had um, Bill Simpich in it, and they had, uh, I don't know, a couple of, they might, you weren't in it, were you, Larry? No. Anyway. These guys have been spewing the same thing. And, but what I liked, the guy confronted her, Priscilla McMillan. Well, um, you know, you're not CIA, I'm not CIA, I'm not CIA. And he, and he confronted her with an application to join the CIA. <laughs> oh, did I do that? Oh, oh, may I don't even remember that. You know, I mean, what, what a bunch of crap. And Posner is so full of it. <laughs> Yeah, I, I, I just wish, I, I, I guess, and, and here's Rob where I, I, I may offer a, a minor correction. Um, I, I wish that people would admit to the fact that in 1960s, 1960s, the 1970s, the, the CIA was not considered to be evil. The Soviet Union was considered to be evil. Tens of thousands of people voluntarily provided information to the CIA. This was considered a patriotic thing. I mean, and, and I'm not defending the CIA for some of the stuff, but I mean, it, being a source for the CIA, having access, you know, and, and the CIA played the game well. I mean, the CIA would recruit all sorts of business people as sources and, and as it's, it's kind of like, you know, if you help provide us information, you travel overseas, you collect, you know, and, and, you know, if you need something like investment information or, you know, we, we would try to help. So this was just a common arrangement. The, the fact that Priscilla applied as a journalist to be a, why, what, I don't understand why she is dishonest about it. Why not just come out and say, of course, this would have been great for my career. <laughs> come on. Well, she, uh, she was more than that. She was being used by them as a journalist to, right. you know, overseas. How did she get an interview with Os Oswald and nobody else sure. did, you know? Um, well, but, I don't mean just a source, but I mean, yeah, working with the CIA was was not an evil no. thing. The so world just, was black and white yeah. in 1960. Yeah. Black and white. Uh, it, the good guys and the bad guys. And you, you know, the bad guys wore black hats and the white good guys wore rode white horses. I mean, that's the way I grew up. And that's what my mother and everyone believed. And and then, but it was the JFK assassination that changed it. All of a sudden, wait a minute, there's gray. Yeah. There's gray. And and, and you would expect, I mean, <clears throat> the CIA is sort of like Rob, you're saying they can't operate. What they can or should have been able to do domestically is. What they can't do is operate on U.S. soil against U.S. citizens. There's absolutely nothing in their charter against not operating against foreign citizens, which is why it was perfectly legal for them to spy at the U.N., to spy on foreign ambassadors, to set up sex traps for foreign ambassadors. You know, anybody who's not American a citizen is fair game. But they weren't doing just that. They were opening well, yeah. mail. I, I, they were, I, yeah. What about chaos? That's Operation a, chaos. I, I'm, that was. Not defending them, but <laughs> but there's you got it. You've got to parse it out. It's kind of like okay, they're here. What are they doing? Where's the line drawn? It's kind of like where did they step over the line? Well, Angleton stepped over the line with chaos. It's oh, like yeah. okay, with MK chaos, we you had the authority to monitor American students who were going overseas 
and doing stuff overseas. You did not have the authority to monitor all the American students mm -hmm. on campus. No, that or wasn't give them LSD. LSD. <laughs> Well, like, OK, the, yeah, the, um, the Phoenix program was uh, not only just a disaster with the number of people that were killed overseas, but also with the Americans uh, phones being tapped and a lot of surveillance where it was uh, it would you call mass surveillance that was happening as well, too, which William Colby is one of the people that blew the whistle on. And I mean. I, that's a, uh, people can criticize like he's just you know he's part of the cia this is horrible that they were doing that but also he's a whistleblower that blew the whistle on the actions that were going on and really exposed a lot of this where there's articles that say that the cia would never recover from this like there are people directors involved in it that were talking about what william colby had done um was a mark on their history in a sense and a mark on the establishment where they would never recover now i look at the other perspective in this as well too so it's not just one perspective i go I mean, if the CIA thinks that doing all this, in a sense, is going to be good, it's important. I mean, the reason why they're doing all these crazy things that we can sit here and say are crazy is because they probably either might have got information, might have been good or bad. I have no clue that are talking about, well, they're doing the same exact thing. I mean, that's the whole reason, reason that we even invested into the um, Men Who Stare at Goats, that project with the, where we're doing LSD experiments, trying to type into remote viewing and psychological warriors because we got a fucking tip off that russia was doing the same exact thing i mean i know a lot about operation paperclip i know a lot about like chemical biological warfare on that aspect of stuff too but it became an issue when you start realizing it's different when you're in the military and you're signing up to be a part of a drug study compared to when you're illegally just giving random civilians drugs and especially in operation midnight climax where you look at they were jugging johns to do these horrible acts and the plan was during the anti-hippie movement which was sparked up during the vietnam where all these hippies were protesting the vietnam war they saw that as an issue with their efforts to deal with the vietnam war and they started drugging people having them go crazy and saying it's the hippies just like the hippies Charles Manson. so you get into this fucking aspect of like they're associating the hippies that are on weed and love and all associated with that and against the uh, Vietnam War. They're going to drug random people, have those people go batshit nuts so they can go. It's the same thing as the hippies. And then you chalk them in a category and now you get the general public to now hate the hippies. Now you're nobody's protesting the war anymore because hippies don't want to go out in the street because they're being attacked by every single civilian. And now you got the Vietnam War back on the road. So I just go, I mean, these are fucking really, really, really crazy, but insanely complicated strategies. But in a sense, if you can separate your own personal feelings and look at the business aspect of it or the, the government aspect of it, dude, it's fucking effective. It's so effective. It's nuts. It, it's not only that, Rob, I can show you a document and, and actually I've written about this. Gary said it. The point is, You've got to look at the origins, not only the origins, but the legal charter of the CIA. There were several documents written when the CIA was created in the period of 1946 to 1948. And these, these documents were essentially national security studies that said, OK, and they were, they were conducted for Truman. And basically, the documents basically say that we have to be prepared to do anything illegal, immoral, unethical that we can do to survive because we are in a war for survival with, with the communist uh, world plague. I mean, it's, it's there in writing. And these are legal government policy documents that literally said, we have to create a service, an intelligence service that is, has no rules, as a matter of fact, that will do all of the things that we know the Soviets were doing. And the Soviets were doing them, by the way. They didn't make this up. So All's what fair goes in, love and war. Yeah, what goes into the CIA charter literally is that kind of language that says, and this is the difference between the legal code that governs covert operations and the legal code that governs military operations. If you're in the CIA, you're allowed to kill people. You're allowed to poison people. You're allowed to do all of the sorts of things 
that you need to do. License to kill, James Bond. This is survival. And that's the way they viewed it. And that's what we were coming out of in the 60s and 70s. So you you can't blame it on the fact that they're just these ex-World War II guys in the CIA at Langley who have this attitude. This is actually part of American legal doctrine. And, and it's still in play. I, I go through it in, in the books in detail. Those authorities are still there. They've never been removed. They even multiple times the CIA has negotiated with the Department of Justice to cover murders committed by CIA officers that are in line with this code. I mean, that's because they do have that kind of protection. The CIA and the, the intelligence, quote, intelligence community has none of the restrictions that the military has. There is no unified code of military justice for the CIA. So, Rob, when you're talking about all of those things, and I'm not saying, a, a, there's a good reason to hate them for ethical and moral reasons. I just think B, there's an even better reason to hate them because they actually never, ever, ever worked. It's like torture. Yes, they're going to tell you whatever you want to hear. It's stupid, but they just don't. We haven't revisited those authorizations from 1947, 1948. It's what, 80 years later? We, Congress is not going to revisit those. They're still there. Well, you can call it an unintended consequence, but I mean, uh, Ted uh, Kaczynski, or fuck, I'm going to say his last name wrong. Ted Kaczynski yeah. was bred was um since he was a kid he was shoved in like a mental institution and they basically bred the Unabomber. He was MK Ultra. Yeah. Did you know that? So he was a he was a subject of MK Ultra, one of the subjects. So you get it. Hey, like, but being a nineteen sixties hippie, come on, you guys got to give me a break. <laughs> well, where's the MK? <laughs> what about Larry? If you're studying documents, did you come across anything with fucking MK Ultra, man? I feel like every time me and Gary talk about it, people just go, "Oh, that's a conspiracy." It's like it's not oh, a conspiracy; it's fucking real. M- MK Ultra was it was absolutely real. Uh, it's just there are two or three flavors to MK Ultra. Basically, they're the LSD, the medical ecstasy, flavor cocaine. of creating. <laughs> well. There's the fake personality. It's, it's, it's like, okay, the fake personality, which was mostly done in Canada, you know, offshore. Well, it would then explain Jacqueline Hyde and then fucking Lee Harvey Oswald's. Multi-personalities. Can we create multi-personalities? Sure, we can. I mean, well, do I we think should it's, be able I, to since they exist anyway, right? I, I would be, yeah, I think it's probably easier with people with borderline personality disorders. It would be easier to be oh, able they to pick people, yeah. Different. Yeah, it'd be, it'd be able to manipulate two different personalities. <laughs> that's, but I, but, that's why you look for your candidates in the psychiatric <laughs> hospital. <laughs> yeah. I mean, and that kind of boils it down, doesn't it? But I also think that we have to also examine the other side of the, the split personalities, which is just creating two profiles on someone, creating someone with a profile that leans this way and creating someone that leans a profile with this way and have them act completely different depending on if what what location that they're in the one thing i always bring up and i'm surprised gary you never mentioned this to me considering our talk about go oswald going back to his apartment um and that cop car that honked and then just drove off the rambler fucking story they had a rambler where uh, uh an oswald lookalike would hop in it and fucking uh, come on man like this is exactly what I was talking about, where you have an account where Tibbetts murder, where they're talking about how uh, a week before one of the cr- people I've heard say it was a crazy waitress that said it, it. She wasn't a good witness at all. But I mean, was she a crazy witness at the diner who said she saw Oswald and Tibbet have a small interaction as I, I think you're confusing two people together. You're, uh, Helen Markham was a waitress that saw the Tibbet murder. Yes. You're thinking of a waitress in a, in a, there was a little diner near, near where Oswald lived, where he would go for breakfast and have coffee. And he, a couple of days before the assassination, he, according to a waitress that worked there, and she was supported by other employees, they told her to, that Oswald came in and complained about his eggs being overcooked or something, and was uh, getting out of hand and he was swearing and this, and- I- that Tippett was there and he was sitting at another table and gave him a look, you know, that there was no indication they knew each other, but he was like, you know, and if, low, if you really, keep, 
if you want something new and exciting, uh, take a look at David Boylan and my Redbird Lee's number two, when we'll try to persuade you that actually that was Oswald at the diner and he had just come from Redbird Field where he had been set up. Oh, really? <laughs> yes, uh, to be part of an airplane hijacking that would take him out of Dallas to Cuba on November 22nd. Oh, is that right? Yeah. And it's pretty solid, actually. Is it? You mean uh, there's yeah. actually documentation? Yeah. I knew about the Redbird Airport thing, that there was a plane there. Uh, we, we have tracked it down pretty. It, it comes from Wayne James. Where do I where do I get that, Larry? Um, it's actually you could uh, your, just, uh, your, just your do article. a search for Redbird Leeds and Hancock or Redbird Red Leeds and okay. Hancock. Hang on. Yeah, I want to I want to see we, that. We've Hang got on. the papers, actually. We've written really long papers on it. Hang on. Hang and on. they're on the Dealey Plaza UK website. Okay. So the diner uh, thing is real. The diner thing is real. Yeah. So he had an interaction with Tibbet at a diner. Yeah, but it didn't mean they meant it that they knew each other. It just meant that they were in the same, having breakfast at the same place. Tippett noticed him being an asshole at breakfast. Yeah, yeah, right. And it, it was very, and, and one of the things that, that you can't prove it, but it's interesting that, of course, Aunt Oswald did not have to punch a time card. Oswald was not, you know, basically they work the hours that they pretty much wanted to and and they you know they're just it's like oh he's at work today and we'll sign him off on doing work today and larry this is the thing that i've been really looking at lately um it seems that oswald wherever he worked he didn't have to punch a time call. riley coffee he could come and go in other words they were front jobs and he was put there. He was placed. He got that job right away. He came to New Orleans and all of a sudden he had a job. He, he had uh, applied several places, didn't get a job, but he, right away this job shows up and he's free to, 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 to leave. And he's got a, he punches in, but it doesn't, he doesn't have he to wonders, be there all day. He wanders it, around a lot. It's pretty, of course, it seems you might also argue that that's why he could keep a job. <laughs> someone's getting him jobs in places where whoever's running the, the company or building knows he's there for purpose as an undercover agent or as a provocateur and it's just a front that he works there that he doesn't have to really work he can come and go and do what's it's funny that all the places he worked were like that it seemed he, he does come and go I, he, well, you got to think if like you're get... central intelligence or if you're a double agent or you're inter whatever, international spy, whatever you want to call it, you have to think at any moment you're going to be called in for a mission or you're going to be called in to do something. You have to go. So you have to be at a job where they allow that to happen, you know, secretly, whether it's an owner making a backdoor deal or something like that. I mean, you have yeah. To and, and if you look at the owners of these companies, look at Riley. He's a right wing. Uh, you know, he's backing uh, CIA ventures here and there. Cuban. Cuban things. He's definitely a right wing. And and at the uh, depository, uh, wasn't it Bill Shelley was supposed to be CIA? We call Larry. it suppository. I, I, I've heard that. Uh, there was rumors that he was in, in you know, and, and Bird owned the building and he's, you know, all these people have connections to intelligence and, and to the right wing uh, severity of, of, of Dallas. And so, you know, you think, who's putting him in these places? Is this just an accident that he's he's finding these jobs and that he has this freedom to do what he wants and well, get around? How much of the how much of just civilian life in general was occupied by mafia territory and CIA or government territory? Because the one thing about Manson, where he was getting his drugs, were was a CIA plant. It that was, was a, that was M that was chaos. Yeah, that was Angle Angleton's chaos. They were giving drugs to those hippies in uh, uh, Ashbury, Ashbury, and the, what they were doing was they were trying to get them to commit crime so that they could defame uh, the uh, hippie, the, the anti-war movement. Yeah, yeah the anti-war, and say, look, these guys are just they're druggies and they they commit crimes and they they were wouldn't be taken seriously as anti-war. Well, that was weird because. Tom O'Neill, who wrote the book Chaos, um, after his book came out, that agency has disappeared. So it's what agency? The one where Charles Manson was getting his drugs at. 
Oh, that was still active until Tom O'Neill. What I like about book. that book is how he goes. In, he he actually got Bugliosi to he he interviewed Bugliosi extensively on the Manson trial, and then he started to suspect that what Bugliosi wrote was a bunch of crap, and and Bugliosi had was not telling the truth about Manson's involvement with like the CIA or whatever. And he tried to ask him more questions and he and Bugliosi quit giving him information, got violently mad at him. And, and I, I thought found a very interesting take on Bugliosi. There's a lot of things in that book that um, about Manson's arrests, you know, they were arrested several times when they were in the desert and he wasn't prosecuted, even though they knew he did crimes. And dude, they let his, it... his hold on his probation officer, Manson's probation officer, let him go travel out of state to go survey fucking land. If that I'm sorry, but does Manson have a degree or any of these types of entitlement to be able to go survey land? I mean, there's a lot of questionable stuff, there's right? Strange stuff. There. I asked the question to you guys. Where it goes, do you think that we could – like anybody that's alive that has information on us, don't you think that it's so valuable right now, especially if they're on their deathbed, to just be like complete amnesty? I think that's what drives this so for so long is that the fact that people haven't spoke up, not in an aspect of fear, but an aspect of they don't want to be in, labeled or slid in with the people that were involved in these. It's like Operation Paperclip. When we forgave those Nazi scientists for their research, Nuremberg trials, all that, when that happened, we did that because they already did the experiments. We can't take those back, but we might as well get the research that they're going to offer if we clear their names in some aspects. I think we should look at that. I mean, if Alan Dulles and all these people that were involved in the Warren Commission, Arlen Specter, all these people that were involved in covering it up, you think that they would even accept the ability, like, just to tell us everything if you give them complete amnesty in those aspects? I think that should have been done back then. Larry wrote a book on this. <laughs> it's called I, Somebody Would Have Talked, and, I, and somebody I, has talked. I, I think the problem is that some people have, people have talked. I mean, but there's two different things. There, there's one thing, about, you know, talk to your family, talk to your best friend, talk to your lawyer. There's another thing to like go to the national press. There, there's just, I, I don't, I just don't expect to see that happen, Rob, because it's what they're all going to tell you is it's over and done. Yeah. And, and well, if Howard I, Hunt confessed well, <laughs> yeah, well, yeah. and to his son and made a video and everything. And yeah, but I know a little bit more about that story. Oh, do you tell me about it? I want to know. <laughs> um, but but one thing I, I would like to get a, a commitment from Rob. There's there's a few more things about JFK and the Bay of Pigs I'd like to get on record before we close that out. But um, it, because they're not in the history books. We'll say the Howard uh, Hunt thing and we'll go to the Bay of Pigs. Okay. I need to know this. Basically, uh, it, it was interesting. At, at a Lancer conference, oh, guys, 10, 11 years ago. We had a fellow in uh, who was, and I, there is a slander issue. There's a legal issue here, so I'll only say what I can say. He had partnered with a fellow who was a multimillionaire because Mark Hunt Cuban. was well. Hmm? Mark Cuban. No, 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 no. Damn. That would be good. But Shark no. Tank investing in some JFK uh, shit. How about that? This is, this is more Hollywood thing, but uh, Hunt had been famous for saying, you know, teasing the press, you know, if you just gave me a million dollars, I know all the details and I'll tell you the details. Well, these guys went to hunt with a million dollar check. Yeah. Literally. Yeah. And said, I know who that was now. Uh, okay. <laughs> uh, and basically said, okay, we're ready. Pay up. Give us detail. You, you've got to give us, you know, I'll some pause detail. it. If somebody needs to tell me who this is. <laughs> I can can pause I? For Larry. It's up to Larry. <laughs> One second, I got to pause. But, uh, actually, actually there you go, Larry. what we what we were told and what what, what was expressed before we really literally did have to move, remove that from the DVDs from the conference was that this this dialogue occurred. He could give no details except that like list of five people that knew, kind of like an org chart, straight line thing. When they started, they said, "Okay." Howard, if, if you can do anything to corroborate this, tell us 
tell us what happened. Where did you meet with Dave Morales, for example? Where, where'd you meet with him? What hotel? Give us the name of a hotel. Give us a date. Let, you know, just give us some minutia to support anything that you're telling us and you get the million dollars. Oh my God. I know who it is. Okay. It's fucking Woody Harrelson. That's why everyone thinks he was on his dad was on the grass. You know, (laughs) but what happened after that was okay. (laughs) That happened. And then later hunt did get sick. Okay. He didn't get any money. He didn't get a book deal. He got sick. And the way I understand it was, it was that point in time that he gave to his son exactly what he'd already given to these guys. And that's what he had available. And, and supposedly it was kind of a, a parting gift to his son because he regretted some things that had gone on between the two of them. Did they make him uh, sick? Hmm? No, they, he had cancer. I know, but did he, they give him cancer? I doubt it. There's He's a lot of it. witnesses in the JFK thing that mysteriously got cancer. And it was like, that's a it little was fucking like, suspicious. He was in his 80s, I think. Okay. Jack Ruby. Uh, well, Jack right. Ruby. Yeah. They gave him cancer. If you, if you want a cancer candidate, he's a, he's a good. He I, is. He would probably be my best one. Yes. Yeah. Uh, yeah. That sounds so or, nuts. Or I don't think people know that they have the, some types of like weaponry like that. Oh, yeah. They can give you a heart attack just like that, you know, and it's not traceable. Uh, I, I would, yeah, in, in Ruby's case, usually I'm yeah. not too excited about those things, but I think that since he, he was coming back to trial. Right. Um, well, he died before that, his trial. It's funny how many people just before they're going to go to trial or be in an uh, interviewed in an, under oath and in a, uh, some investigation, they die. I mean, I, I, you can say what you want, but the odds, I mean, like the House Assassinations Committee, how many people died within just before they were to testify? I can name half a dozen just off the top of my head. That's not that's that's not. Uh, and, and just to make Rob just to make Rob feel good about it, MK Ultra, I, I know Rob must know that the guy that was behind the LSD project visited Jack Ruby in jail. <laughs> yeah. I mentioned yeah. that in Gary's episode. I said the same therapist for um, Charles Manson was the same therapist for um, Jack Ruby. And then afterwards, Jack Ruby's having visions of Jews burning in the street. And you start getting into this aspect where if you watch the documentary, the very first thing before I even dived into after actually my talk with Jim, um, I watched a documentary on um, YouTube that was like an hour or something long explaining the backgrounds between Oswald's character and Jack Ruby. And Oswald was like my example I use was documented as a person who seemed like he wasn't loved by his family, which we all know is completely false. You're not writing letters to your mother from Russia if you aren't, aren't loved by your family. But then Jack Ruby was given a different diagnosis as a psychological liar and all these types of things that would be able to manipulate your words. Jack Ruby was, but then the ending result with Jack Ruby in his last like little therapy session with this guy who was the same person for Charles Manson, he's having these insane, intense visions and these weird hallucinations where he seems like a completely different person where I start going, this is the drugs we're talking about. Now to think they haven't perfected a method or a secret cocktail, maybe not to give you cancer, even though you could do radiation exposure too much of it can be a bad thing. But if you do something to make someone's mind clearly seem like they're on some type of drug, but you, then you label it as insanity. I mean, that's how yeah. people get locked away in mental institutions. And, well, then- and, that, and that's, yeah. And Ruby, Ruby was a setup for that. By that time, you know, he's, he knows he's, he's been set up. He know there's an, every reason he would be paranoid. So LSD is a, it's, I mean, it's introducing not Mike, LSD in the equation is, it's like almost a no brainer. It's not and Michael Keaton. Is, say, it? is it Michael Keaton? Hey, <laughs> is it fucking no, Batman? No, no. <laughs> okay. I, one Bruce thing I have to disagree. Bruce Wayne, I guess that's it. Okay. I have to disagree about Oswald. He hated his mother. So why was he writing letters? Well, you write letters. He was writing letters a lot for a lot of reasons. The main reason he was writing letters back was the Russians were reading them. And in them, he's spewing that he's, he'll die for the Russian country and all this stuff. And also, she sent him some money. 
and he needed he needed help from her to get back into the states and that kind of stuff. He he hated his mother. I'm convinced. I think that. that was just a yeah a matter of. Uh, but okay, let me. I, I got to get back to the Bay of Pigs here to, uh, to a few things. And and Rob actually we mentioned. And actually, these are questions that Gary asked when we had the panel discussions about withdrawing the air support and that sort of thing. And and I guess I I just feel compelled to make it part of the record. Holy shit! It was Al Pacino. All right, that's my last guess. <laughs> <laughs> that's my last guess. <laughs> he never, guys, who's listening right now, he never told me off air who it was. So I'm fucking still taking shots in the dark. <laughs> Phil's Al Pacino. That's why they made Scarface. Uh, I, a shot in the dark. I, I don't want any horses' heads showing up. Okay. Um, You're getting Larry okay. off track here. <laughs> so, anyway, I, I guess what's important is, and this is JFK was, was a pragmatist. I mean, he was, we talked about this earlier. He would, you know, he, he, he was a bit of a risk taker, but he would, he would do, he would make some concessions. And that's one of the saddest things about the Bay of Pigs is that Richard Bistel and Tracy Barnes managed to go to Miami and tell all the CIA officers and all the Cuban exiles what what evil things that JFK had done. What the Cuban exiles had no way of knowing was what JFK had authorized during the course of the landings that he had absolutely said, don't ever do this. You know, here are your orders. We have to be totally niable. These are things that you can't do. But as things got worse and worse on the beachhead, he actually tried to make some accommodations. One of the things, and it's, it's ama- this is amazing, um, he gave an order that the military officer that was brief, briefing the Cuban exile leaders that were going in on the landing be told that there were there would be no American air cover. Under no circumstances would the Americans provide air cover. And that briefing was held, and the CIA officer swears that he told them that because the president had ordered it. So there was never any doubt from JFK's point of view that he had given that order and that it had been carried out, okay? Now, what we know from the Cubans themselves, that word never got passed down. So they, they were told by the sea officers above them that there would be air cover, and they expected it. So there, there was a total disconnect between the orders JFK was giving and what the Cuban exiles expected. What... And I I think you brought this up last time, Gary. What JFK had said is there can, the Cubans can fly attack missions from the airfield on the landing site. That's no Americans involved. The Cubans have got to do it. There will be no airstrikes out of Nicaragua. We can't do that. I mean, because there are reporters in Nicaragua. They're noticed that there will be 20 or 30 airplanes taking off headed for Cuba every few hours. No, you can't fly airstrikes out of Cuba. Okay. And the Air Force is not going to do any kind of support for you. Well, during the course of those three days, JFK gave in totally and authorized airstrikes being flown out of Nicaragua. They they conducted airstrikes every night against Cuban airfields. They conducted supply drops over the beachhead every night. JFK actually authorized the United States Air Force to conduct slight supply drops over the beachhead. The Air Force had no notice, they weren't prepared, and that didn't happen, but he authorized it. It's just that nobody made it happen. JFK. Why don't we, why don't we know? Why isn't that in any of the books? Well, it's in my book. <laughs> but you're in your book, but I mean. But, but but that's something the CIA, and it actually comes out of the Taylor. So why, why didn't that, they destroy Castro's Air Force? His fighters, okay. he had fighters left. He had 50% of, the, okay. 50% of the fighters were left after the pre-landing strikes. So why didn't the Cubans destroy them? The, the Cubans, okay, two things. First of all, The Cubans themselves, the Cuban pilots, conducted airstrikes on the Cuban base, air bases every day, but they failed. I mean, the the honest answer is they failed to take out the Cuban Air Force themselves. 
whether it's weather, Castro had the planes moved. I mean, you know, <clears throat> whatever you want to blame it on. That's they didn't they didn't. I've, I, you know, I've, I've heard three or four different versions in different books uh, of what happened. Yeah. Well, there's the version that Kennedy denied the strikes, and that's the one that the CIA is feeding the Cubans. Then there was that he um, okayed them or, or that he okayed them, but Cabell or somebody didn't do it. And then there was one that, that, that they, he okayed it and they came, but they were on different time because they were in Nicaragua and they were an hour late arriving and it was too late. All the, all the uh, guys were captured. All, all, all three of those happened. I mean, basically... <laughs> <laughs> All three of those did happen. What Kennedy canceled, there was supposed to be an airstrike at dawn flown by the Cubans out of Nicaragua the day of the landing. JFK canceled that, okay, because there had already been so many pub much publicity about the pre-landing strikes. However, he told the Bell and J.C. King, the officers assigned to the project, that they could tell him if if they would call him up and make a case for it, he might approve it. Yeah, but they were going to have to give him a convincing argument as to why those strikes were absolutely mandatory. They refused to call him up and argue that point. The reason they did, okay, is that they would have had to do two things. They would have had to admit that 50% of the Cuban Air Force was still there. He didn't know that. Nobody had told him that. There had been time to cancel this whole thing, and they would have had to admit that they had. Yeah, so they didn't want to tell him what they had been holding back from him as to why the strike was absolutely mandatory. On on the second thing, um, basically, JFK authorized the Cubans to go ahead and fly airstrikes against the Cuban bases, which they literally failed to take out. Uh, he actually authorized them on the second day for American pilots to fly with them and carry out attacks. And on the second day, there were a series of very successful airstrikes on hundreds of Cuban soldiers were lost. Napalm was used at, uh, at the beachhead. That happened, absolutely did happen, and he authorized it. And, and the strange thing is the Cubans know this. Like, that, so they know that those airstrikes did occur. Now, what, what the, the third and last day, JFK authorized a series of jet strikes, Navy jet fighters over the beachhead, defend the beachhead so that the Navy could extract the Cubans. Okay, That's, that was what was supposed to happen because he had finally been convinced that there was no way. And... And although he had been told that they could just get off the beach into the mountains, he came to realize that that was never going to happen. I mean, the Cubans were in between them and the mountains. So he issued an order that the Navy execute its plan to evacuate the Cubans off the beaches and reland them somewhere else. The problem is, even though he had ordered that plan to be made, it never was made. There was no Navy extraction plan. And when the Navy was so screwed up, the Navy did not even have a comm channel from the command carrier to the beachhead. They were using the wrong radio frequencies. The Navy, the U.S. Navy, was not in communication with the Cuban exile air group. The Navy... The Navy ships and the Navy planes couldn't talk to the Cuban pilots that were flying those missions. And so that, as you said, the Navy, that whole thing on the last day was screwed up. There was no, and nobody had told the Cubans. Can uh, I, like, oh, yeah, we're, you guys need to be prepared to retreat from the beaches. Oh, we're not, no, we're, we're, there are no boats here. There, how do you expect us to get off the beach? I am. Um, you know, it was just a total screw up, but he, but he kept, basically he kept piece by piece trying to do at least something to preserve the landing. And it, it just wasn't going to happen. I wanted to touch on what you said about Howard Hunt before. 
Um, <laughs> I just found an article where it's talked about um, these guys meant to take the powers of president presidency and run amok. Hunt, an ex CIA man who loved operating in the shadows and joined Nixon's special investigations unit, aka the Plumbers, as a one hundred dollar a day consultant in nineteen seventy one, specialized in political sabotage. Among his first assignments, forging cables linking the Kennedy administration to the assassination of South Vietnam's president. After that, he began sniffling around Ted Kennedy's dirty laundry to see what he could dig up there. Being a former CIA man, he had no problem contemplating the use of firebombs and once thought about slathering LSD on the steering wheel of an unfriendly newspaperman's car, hoping it would leach into his skin and cause a fatal accident. But all of his various plots and subterfuge in the end, only one of them mattered. The, failure bur the failed burglary at the Watergate Hotel in Washington, D.C. in the spring of 1972. I just came across that trying to figure out what fucking actor was. <laughs> but <laughs> but what, I, what I wanted to highlight there was when I saw that was it just kind of gives a little bit of background of what uh, basically people in the CIA were thinking in their head. Slathering LSD on a steering wheel. Was that a planned thing? No, but the guy's fucking skepticizing and talking about it. And if you tell people this stuff, they think you're nuts. <laughs> and well, here's there's, there are two things. There are two things. First of all, I, I think this reflects something that you mentioned earlier, Rob. There were a bunch of CIA officers who had a personal vendetta against Kennedy long afterwards. I mean, Hunt did try drafting those cables. Hunt was trying to create stuff, even at the White House, to plant stuff to make Kennedy look bad. Years and years later, so there is this ongoing vendetta to make JFK look bad and thereby the CIA look better somehow, even though that's insane. The other thing we've got to keep in mind, and I think this is a good example, somebody was looking through Hunt's personnel file. And you got to remember, Hunt was, if, if you got to pick, I don't know if you've ever heard of uh, the gang that couldn't shoot straight. Yeah, yeah. The famous book about the mob. Hunt was like the CIA officer who couldn't do spy stuff, even though he wrote spy novels. He wrote very successful spy novels, but he couldn't, he, he, he would do things like he got a meeting reported to the police. He got himself reported as a spy. But because of a meeting he was holding in Miami because he was in a motel room talking so loud about all these plots that everybody in rooms both on both sides of him reported it to the police. There's a terrific, <laughs> terrific uh, movie on stars. It's not a movie. It's a, a series, a TV series on Watergate. It's called Gaslit. And it you have to see it. And they go right into how these burglars bungled that it, it was it just totally amazing how they bungled it first with the tape on the door and then they had a walkie talkie to warn them the police were coming and they didn't have batteries in it <laughs> or the batteries were dead or he had it shut off or something and then i mean it was just one bungling thing like they wanted to get caught you know just one that's why i i kind of suspect i think the cia was behind uh that and they foiled and, and because all those guys were ex-CIA guys, I mean, the Cubans and uh, McCord and Hunt and Lit and uh, Sturgis. So even though they weren't officially working for the CIA, what if they went in there to bungle that and get and get Nixon caught to get it's a coup d'etat to get rid of Nixon without shooting him. And and these guys uh, bungled it. I mean, it's just amazing. Well, one argument I, that Eugenio Martinez wrote a great uh, piece on how Hunt recruited him for the plumbers. And he said, what, you know, they, they were always impressed with Hunt because they thought he was like a real inside guy with the CIA. But when they went to burgle Ellsworth's office, Eugenio Martinez said, you know, we were just kind of perplexed because Howard didn't seem to be doing any of the standard trade craft practices. It's like we we knew what we were supposed to be doing and Hunt's just wandering around like aimlessly leaving prints all over the place and everything. So I, I, I know, Gary, it, it does. I have a hard time envisioning how it could be that stupid. And, and like Hunt's running this thing from 
next door and leaves all this material and it's just a quandary as to whether Hunt really was wrote the best spy novels in the world and was the worst spy <laughs> or he he's intentionally doing this I I could I could go either way <laughs> I, I recommend I, that get yeah. I recommend that series though Sean Penn plays John Mitchell and you would not believe it's Sean Penn it looks exactly like Mitchell I mean it's just incredible well before we start promoting documentaries let's promote your guys stuff we've been talking for two hours so oh okay we get carried away i didn't know if you knew it's that. fun i mean it went by quick i'm still <laughs> looking up carried. the freaking actor on my phone <laughs> yeah. at least at least at his book look in saint john's book what's the book yeah. it's in saint john hunt's book what's it called um what's the title of that book um oh damn it i'll google it um, St. John, honey, he wrote one about his mother, Dorothy, and then he wrote one about his father's, uh, I can't confession. The yeah. Uh, yes. Confession. Promote your guys links. Gary, where can people find okay. you? Okay. Uh, www.theotheroswald.com. It's my website. And I have a Facebook page, uh, with the same title. Larry and for me for me just go to Amazon look for Larry Hancock you'll see my book you'll find a link to the I blog. better get an email from you saying like this is this guy it was Jason Bateman <laughs> <laughs> um I'll make sure I link all your guys links in the description it was a pleasure chatting with you guys I'm sure we're going to do another panel episode eventually um but thanks for listening to this episode of out of the blank stay tuned for our next episode